So the most interesting thing to me is that I, process mining is really connected to the operations, the physical world of the company. And there's a lot of process going on inside and outside the data system. I started working on this uh, in the late 90s as a research project, right? And, and now it's a complete industry. So I think there are many developments that have happened that I find uh, super uh, exciting. Well, Lin Kong, uh, thanks for joining me on the show today. Thanks, Richie. It's great to be here. Brilliant. I think uh, just to begin with, um, let's talk about uh, what exactly process mining is. So uh, maybe, Will, you can start. How do you think about it? Yeah, so, so process mining has been a technology that has been developed over the last, let's say, 25 years. Uh, so it starts from event data, and the goal is to use this event data, which is available in any organization, to first show uh, what is really happening, often very surprising uh, for people. Uh, so people often have an idea of what the processes are like, but then they, they see it based on the evidence. It's, it's typically very, uh, very different. And then you use, uh, let's say, these process mining results to improve the process. Uh, so you can also uh, identify where are bottlenecks that you did not expect or that you would like to remove or where are compliance problems. If you have enough data, you can even, uh, let's say, predict that something bad is going to happen. And uh, that's Kong's areas of, of expertise. And in all cases, you would like to take action to actually improve the process. So it's a very generic technology. Uh, and, and it's pretty sure that in the future, let's say, most organizations will use that for many of their processes. Um, this seems really useful. Uh, I think a lot of people will have understand the idea of data mining. So uh, are process mining and data mining related to each other? The difficulty is that uh, people talk about AI, machine learning, data mining, and it's all very blurry. So I think the, the best way to explain it is that process mining is a unique technology. It is not the same as data mining. It is not the, the, the same as mainstream machine learning, for example, neural networks. Uh, the starting point for process mining, doing discovery and conformance checking is something very different. And it is different because it is this mix of both processes and data, right? And, and that combination make, makes many of the algorithms uh, unique. I understand it's very confusing for people. Uh, so you could say, uh, process mining is a kind of machine learning. And I would say, yes, that is correct. But at the same time, it is very, it's a very different technology than, for example, deep learning or neural networks. Okay, so um, it's really a specialized set of techniques in order to help you understand your processes and help you make changes to your processes. Sure, sure, yeah. All right. And well, uh, since you mentioned um, AI, uh, perhaps, Gong, can you tell us how AI fits into process mining? Yeah, I think uh, there's, uh, um, with the generative AI, I think there's a lot of potential. And, uh, and I think as Will already mentioned that I, there's a lot of the predictive process mining capabilities that we can build into. And then also there are conversational interface that you can put over process mining technologies to have much better interaction between the process state and process insights with a human. As you, you know, like um, process mining as Will mentioned, it's like, a somewhat complicated technology that's super important for the company. Therefore, having a convenient um, conversation interface is going to be very, very helpful um, for practitioners. Yeah. Okay, so um, it sounds like it's maybe early stages for incorporating AI into process mining, but there's a, a lot of potential. It's very there. exciting, yes. Yeah. All right, I'd love to talk about that more uh, later on perhaps, but uh, perhaps um, it's worth talking about uh, how people actually make use of process mining. So. Um, Maybe one of the most popular use cases uh, of process mining at the moment. Yes, yeah, so, so if I may kick, kick off, I, I think many organizations start with uh, standard financial processes. Uh, so there are any, any organization has something called purchase to pay, uh, order to cash. Uh, so the standard processes that an organization has to buy stuff and to sell stuff, right? Any, any organization of some size has that. And that is where most organizations start for the simple reason uh, that it is completely known what kind of data is available. It is pretty standard. So you can basically plug and play 
uh, and immediately do process mining. And that's why many organizations uh, start with that. We also have a lot of experience uh, knowing in these types of processes what are typical problems because we are analyzing, let's say, the same process for thousands of organizations. And of course, uh, you learn after a while, okay, these are the typical problems that you encounter uh, within many uh, companies. At the same time, eh, so that's the easy entry point. Uh, at the same time, I would argue that for a car manufacturer or for an airline or for a hospital, these processes are not the core processes. Eh? So for an airline, the core process is to move people from A to B. Uh, if you look at the car manufacturer, the core process is to build cars that are beautiful and are very reliable, etc. So what you see is that most organizations start with these standard, let's say financial administrative processes. And after having positive experiences with that, they move more to the processes that are really unique and core to the organization itself. But of course you should make more effort then because then uh, your process is probably unique. That's interesting that um, you suggest starting with um, something that's sort of standard, like the general administration, financial stuff, and then moving on to something that's core to your business. You go for like the easy stuff first and then move on to maybe the, the high value, um, but maybe a bit riskier stuff later on. Okay. Um, do you have any examples of companies that are heavily using process mining at the moment? Yes, yeah, so, so of course, uh, like there are many organizations already using process mining, right? Uh, 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 I think many people do not realize that half of the Fortune 500 companies are already using process mining. What you also see uh, is that, let's say, the, uh, the adoption in Europe is more advanced than the adoption in the US. Yes? So, 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 so what you see, it depends where the audience is, uh, but in countries like the Netherlands and Germany, it is much more widely used. But if you think of, let's say, examples of companies, uh, one could, for example, look at the car manufacturers. And I think it's safe to say that uh, most of the car manufacturers are already, already using process mining. And so, for example, if you look at the company like BMW, that, that I know myself quite well, uh, they are analyzing over 50 processes using process mining. And this ranges from, let's say, painting a car and these types of things to things related to, let's say, uh, servicing a car, uh, to the financial things that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so examples are only present. It's also, if you, if you look at, for example, uh, medical companies are using it, uh, like a company like Uber is using it. Uh, the, the, the examples are everywhere. Yeah, I think that um, I, there's an, a number of companies, uh, for example, HP and Dell have been uh, working with us as well. And, and HP save a lot of money in terms of cash flow operations. And, and I think uh, um, there's a, I think on our, our website, we probably have a list of all the companies that um, we can highlight as well. Yeah. So um, it sounds like this is predominantly being used by perhaps larger organizations. So um, is there some sort of requirement to having like a large scale in order to be able to make use of process mining? You're, you're right. Uh, the threshold to get started with process mining is, of course, lower for larger organizations. And so, for example, uh, we often use the 80-20 rule, right? Uh, that, that, that if you do process mining, you find out that 80% of the things that you're handling, you're handling, handling them more or less correct. And 20% that is a problem, right? Uh, there is a compliance problem, there is a performance problem or something like that. So if you are an organization and you only have 100 cases, that means that you find 20 cases where there is a problem. However, if, if you are a large company, like for example, Siemens, where you are having millions of transactions each year, and then let's say from a couple of million, 20%, you can see that the return on investment is much uh, quicker. And so what, what I expect to see is that, uh, like it starts with the larger, larger organizations, but of course our goal will be that process mining will become a kind of commodity that also, let's say, uh, smaller enterprises will uh, 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 use. 
but that's not the logical starting point. But we also have also many examples of, let's say, smaller organizations applying it. Uh, but you need to to compute what is the return on investment of doing that. And for a larger organization, that is much easier. This is also where I think uh, uh, the recent trend of large language model will probably help because um, process mining um, is a piece of enterprise software. As any enterprise software, there's learning curves and sometimes requires setup and all these kind of things. So in a lot of ways, like large enterprises will have that capacity to do these kind of setup and, and onboarding. Well, for smaller ones, hopefully with generative AI and large language model, these conversational interface will make it much easier for people to get on board. So, so you're sort of lowering the threshold in terms of how you get started with onboarding, process yeah. mining. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, maybe the more technical side of process mining. So um, can you give me an idea of what sort of techniques um, process mining encompasses? Yes, so, so if you look at the different phases, if you would roughly look at what are the the different steps that you apply when you do process mining, then the first step is extracting the data from your information systems. As of you're using uh, Salesforce, Oracle, SAP, or in any of these enterprise software systems, they are loaded with event data. And the first step is always scoping what you're interested in, extracting it and making it ready to do process mining. So that's step one. Then step two is uh, what we call process discovery. So based on the event data, you uh, uncover what is really happening. Yeah? So you create transparency. And as I mentioned earlier, this is often shockingly different than what people expect. And that in itself already has a value, right? Because people become aware of many problems. Uh, that in, I think in the back of the mind, people had a notion that there was a problem, but it then becomes very visible and people uh, will be eager to address it. Uh, that is step two. Step three is that you do uh, conformance checking. Uh, and that basically means that you have an idea of what you want to happen and you look at what is really happening. And for the, for the most important pain points, uh, you start setting triggers. Uh, so if a supplier, for example, often changes the price, leading to all kinds of chaos in your organization, uh, you can detect when that is often happening for a certain supplier. Uh, that, that's what we call conformance checking. So this sounds like you might have two problems then. So either your process is stupid to begin with, or you have a sensible process, but people aren't actually complying with that process. Is that what I understand by conformance checking, those two different cases? So the, the, when we talk about processes, indeed, there is the process what people expect to happen or what people want to happen, and there is reality. And conformance checking exactly tries to, to see where the biggest differences are. And there are many deviations that are pretty harmless, right? You don't have to worry about uh, them, uh, but there may also be, let's say, deviations that are causing incredible delays or are very risky from a compliance point of view. And if you have a lot of data, then you can even go one step further and you can predict that there is going to be a problem, right? That, that is a, a use case that I think at this point in time is only interesting for companies that have relatively stable processes uh, uh, and are able to, to also precisely describe what they want to happen. In all cases, the final step is that you actually change the process because it's very important that uh, uh, you should not stop at diagnostics and uh, detecting that there is a problem or predicting that there is a problem, it's very important to take the action. And that is the reason why, why many of our customers are earning a lot of money because they turn these insights into actions. And, uh, and that is something that, that is crucial. Uh, so, so these are roughly the steps. I, I'm not sure whether Kong would like to, to add something to that. Yeah, I think uh, first, I, wanna, I do want to say like, the, the process are not necessarily stupid and, and most people design the process to uh, certain desirabilities and it's just reality is much more complicated. You may have an approval process in place, but suddenly a customer comes in over the July 4th weekend, something has to be done, otherwise you're losing the customer. 
you override some of the stuff in order to make things happen. So um, in a lot of ways, people are trying to do the right thing and the, real, the, the, the complicated reality is you have a lot more process going on and then things do deviate from the original design. And the beauty of process mining is ability to capture these and really understand whether some of deviation may probably be become part of the process from now on as you understand them. Some of the deviations are not necessarily correctly done, therefore you need to fix them, right? So I think from that perspective, um, it's actually very helpful, even if you have very good process modeling capability, process mining is still gonna be very useful as time goes on. Yeah, and, and following that, I, I think after conformance checking, we, we have this notion of so-called process observability. Then, and the right thing is uh, like uh, some of the important thing is to basically put some of these things that you are very interested in uh, looking at monitoring into the dashboarding and through our EMS system so people can uh, observe them on, uh, on a regular time frame. And then, uh, as Will said, like um, as you observe them, you design actions, you design certain things to improve your process and, and saving, saving money and be more efficient as you run through the process, yeah. Okay, um, uh, perhaps you can tell me a bit more about uh, the predictions. I don't know, uh, maybe Kong, do you wanna take this? So um, I think like um, with the standard machine learning problem, usually the output you get from it is like, oh, I've made a prediction of something. Um, and you meant, uh, Will, you mentioned that um, maybe sometimes you want to make predictions about processes, but in general, like what what is the sort of output from um, a process mining analysis? So I can give some very concrete examples. Like we, we use the prediction capability pretty broadly. And, and uh, it's usually trying to like predict something bad is going to happen, help you alert you uh, ahead of time so you can do something um, uh, correspondingly. Uh, some of them are actually machine learning and, and uh, supervised learning. Some of them are actually unsupervised learning. For example, uh, we have this capability called a duplicate invoice checker. Um, what it's trying to do is basically like looking through uh, the invoices you're paying, understanding which two invoices are actually duplicates of each other. And, and if it's identical, it's very easy, but most of the time it's not identical. There's a different name, like slight typo in the supply name, a slight different amount, slight different date, all these kind of things, right? So internally, we, we have built a duplicate invoice checker use so-called um, clustering and matching machine learning based on matching functions in order to detect those uh, duplicates. Now, if you imagine like, like it's a lot easier to prevent the duplicate invoice being paid instead of after you paying them and you have to chase the money back, right? So this is where the predictability com comes in. Like you, you look at it and you, as the invoice coming through, you basically predict, okay, this looks like a duplicate. Therefore you want to put a block on it or you slow its payment and, and then, then go ahead and, and in, in, in examine them before you really pay them. And that's one example. Uh, here we, don't really use so-called uh, supervised machine learning. It's more unsupervised matching functions and similarity functions. Large language model can already help a lot over there. Um, but there are other more predictive cases. For example, you want to predict whether this invoice is going to be paid late, right? And you're going to miss the deadline. Or your supplier is going to pay you late and you're going to, they're going to miss the deadline, right? So all these kind of things, these are basically more predictive. You have to look at the behavior of the past um, uh, supplier and the behavior of such kind of invoices with the same amount of uh, amount, and then there are you more you have more sophisticated supervised learning capability. Um, but when we do supervised learning, we always like we don't mix the data from different clients. So we basically protect the uh, proprietoriness and the privacy of our our clients, making sure like no data leakage is happening. So we actually have to tailor the model to specifically to the client's information in order to build the model. Yeah. It just seemed like uh, even sort of fairly simple but common tasks like uh, checking whether this invoice is a duplicate or not. You've got, um, once you're getting at scale, you've got a chance for like really improving the efficiency the efficiency of your financial setup and things like that. Yeah, so millions, sound, of, yeah. yeah millions of dollars easily, yeah. Uh, that that's a great benefit, <laughs> uh, saving millions of dollars. Uh, excellent. Uh, so uh, in terms of tooling, uh, because uh, you both, uh, uh, strongly affiliated with uh, Celonis, but can you t maybe you talk about like uh, in general, um, like what are the tools people use for process mining? Yeah, so so if you look at the market, and then uh, it's very interesting that Gartner released uh, the so-called magic quadrant earlier this year, 
uh, identifying process mining as a separate category of tools, right? And, and I've been working in the field for many years, and I'm very happy that it is now recognized really as a, as a separate, uh, let's say, category of tools. Like if you look at the market as a whole, then uh, like I think there are like uh, 40 uh, companies commercially offering process mining capabilities. Yeah? So, 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 so there are, uh, let, let's say, quite some, some companies offering uh, this. However, if you look at um, uh, like the market share, uh, we, let's say, Salonis are by far the largest, right? It depends a bit on how you count. Uh, but, but I think everybody agrees that, that more of the half, more than half of the process mining customers are, are using uh, 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 uh I think it's also important to differentiate if you talk about process mining. Uh, there are, let's say, process mining tools that, all, uh, that focus more on the specialist, the data scientist that is using it as a tool. And there are more, let's say, what we call enterprise level process mining tools. Uh, that are broader, where the goal is also that uh, many people in the organization are consuming the process mining results. Uh, earlier, when I was talking about conformance checking, I was basically talking about uh, uh, making the differences vi visible because what you be between what you want to happen and what really happens. And it is very important to make these things visible at a large scale. And so we have uh, several customers where thousands of users inside the organization are looking at these results. And this is key because you can only, let's say, change behavior and you can only change processes if people are aware of the problems, right? So, 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 so I think there is a, uh, to answer your question, there is a, uh, many offerings, but you, they are not necessarily comparable to each other. So we'll, we'll maybe take the, the enterprise and the sort of individual data scientist cases separately. But so um, I presume like your event data is that going to live in a, in a data warehouse or something like that. So um, is still on this, is that going to hook up to like I'm trying to work out how it fits in with a broader software ecosystem. So uh, does Solonis hook up with your data warehouse? Is that what happens? You can think of process mining as a layer on top of existing applications, right? So. Uh, there is uh, there is data in all the different source systems. Yeah? So, like an organization of some size has uh, 200 different uh, information systems: Salesforce, SAP, Oracle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And most of the process problems are not inside a single system. Most of the process problems are, let's say, at the boundaries of all of these different uh, systems. So that's why it, why for us it is very important to uh, to extract these event data from these source systems and bring it into a shape that you can actually use it in a meaningful uh, way. And this is often, let's say, uh, the part where most of the effort goes into. After that, process mining does its job kind of automatically, but bringing the data in in the right shape is something that is uh, very important. If you think of classical data warehousing systems, uh, they typically mostly work with numbers, if I can uh, explain it like that. Uh, so they are counting how many items did I sell in this month, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at event data, it is slightly different, right? Because these are also the steps in the production process. I don't know. Uh, the treatment of COVID patients where, uh, where we record what kind of medicine a patient gets every day, et cetera, et cetera. So, and this is different data than data typically in the very idealized data warehousing environment. I think that earlier we talked about the difference between process mining and, and data mining. I, I think to me, when I joined a company a year ago, the most interesting thing to me is that I, process mining is really connected to the operations, the physical world of the company. Right. And, and there's a lot of process going on inside and outside the data system. It's, it's super interesting if you can actually, that's why I think we are at the first innings of process mining. Because once you start bringing both data sitting inside the ERP and, and data warehousing, as well data going on in the factory floor, the, all these sensor things, all these combined together, it's amazing like how efficient you can make um, cooperation and enterprises be, right? So it, to me, it's like, like for um, of creating the assembly line, <laughs> this kind of thing. So, yeah. 
Um, yeah, certainly uh, improving efficiency is something uh, that's top of mind for a lot of businesses right now. So it does seem uh, very timely to be talking about this. Um, so uh, one last question on, on tooling before we move on is, uh, so we talked about the sort of uh, Salonis and the enterprise use case. For individual data scientists, I know we have a, a lot of Python users, a lot of our users uh, in the audience. So uh, how might they uh, get started going about process mining? Yeah, I'm actually very new, so Will has a lot more knowledge about this. And I think Python is certainly helpful. And, and I think uh, if you want to do machine learning on top of the process data and all the uh, things, um, uh, Python, um, within Solonis, we offer a so-called uh, machine learning workbench as well to help people uh, have uh, scripts, uh, Python scripts run. And but we also internally has this SQL-like language called a process query language which provides a lot of capability and functionalities for you to interact with the process data in a much easier way comparable to SQL. Um, and this is, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if we have a, a we, we have we have a whole website section dedicated to edu uh, educate people about PQL, which can definitely be a good starting point to look into. I know in Europe, Will has classes and, and teaching people about process mining as well as PQL languages and, yeah. Thing, thing really well. yeah, so, 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 so perhaps to add to that, like, like if you look at the, in the scientific world, let's say PROM is one of the, let's say, standard tools that people use. It is also a tool with the UI. Uh, I would say it is not intended as industry strength, but more as a, as a play yard for all kinds of algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, what we see in the last like five years is that uh, many uh, young people are using Python so we are. We also developed uh, something called PM for Pi, and that's a Python library uh, where you can uh, apply the basic algorithms. It is also possible, let's say, from Salonas to let's say call these types of routines basically like any Python library. However, uh, I think it's very important to distinguish between let's say the enterprise situations and let's say the educational situation, because they are very uh, uh, different. And so if you are uh, dealing with, I don't know, billions of events, let's say most of the open source stuff does not work anymore. And I think even if you look at well-known cases like the, uh, let's say, purchase to pay and order to cash and all of these standard processes, I think people typically understand, uh, underestimate uh, like the complexity of the data models behind it, right? Uh, so, so, so this is not a simple flat file. Uh, you're dealing with suppliers, with customers, with orders, with items, uh, with invoices, et cetera, et cetera. So this is typically, let's say, quite complicated. Uh, as such, it's, there are these open source and Python alternatives to get in touch with the technology and really understand it. But if you go to the enterprise use case, you typically need to uh, to, to 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 start using commercial software. Yeah. Okay. So it um, the message I'm getting is that it actually requires quite a lot of data engineering in order to get started with this because your data for any given process is going to live in several different places, and you've got to find a a way to bring it all together to start doing it doing the analysis. That's also why I indicated that many organizations start with the standard processes where we can really help people to get started super quickly, right? Because then we know what uh, tables to look at, et cetera. Just imagine that if you are ordering something from Amazon or something like that, right? And you have dragged and dropped some articles in your, in your, um, you know, on your shopping list and you say, now I buy something. You should imagine the moment that you push the button, okay, now I pay that in the, in the information system, many different tables are being updated just by this single action because your, your, the, the table with customer information is being updated, but you have an order. The order consists of multiple items. Uh, the items that you have ordered, some may be in stock, some may not be in stock. Some are sold directly by Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. So behind the scenes, lots of things are, are, are happening. And, uh, for the known use cases, like this is pretty standard, but if you go to a new application domain, this is more involved. Also, like in a typical uh, enterprise setup, there's usually multiple personas. 
And uh, as Will was saying, like with the commercial software, you can have the analysts and data scientists setting things up. And then the business users can just interrogate the data in a much more intuitive and straightforward way. And for some of for example, we have this product called a business miner, where you don't really need to be a data scientist. And you just go in and it will highlight with a few, you answer a few questions and boom, you will get uh, very easy to, to monitor and a dashboard thing. Okay. So perhaps um, for any organizations wanting to get started, you mentioned that like the financial case is easy, I guess, like all the data is going to be in Salesforce or some equivalent. Uh, so maybe it's just like one or two sources to deal with rather than the process being spread over lots of different cases. Okay. Um, so um, who needs to be involved in adopting process mining? Like what are the kind of roles or teams that need to be involved in like your first process mining project? Um, Kong, do you want to go first this time? Uh, I think, uh, sure, I can give it a try <laughs> jumping in here. And I think the first thing is you need to have a company executive leadership commitment to improving the process and, and um, um, looking for efficiency. And, and without that, it's probably difficult. And, and then once you have the support of that and uh, you need someone like data scientist or analyst with the, the technical mindset and willing to work with, um, for example, Salonis, and in order to start with some use cases and drive, drive it through. And then um, after, after the initial setup, I think you probably want to have stakeholder buy-in from different lines of business. For example, we can monitor the AT process or constable process, and then um, whoever is the line of business owner, the, the CFOs or uh, financial directors needs to be like basically monitoring them and be, be bought into the whole thing. So um, I don't know, Well, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so, 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 so I think if you look at research, uh, then what you see is that, uh, let's say the organizations that are most effective in applying process mining, they build a kind of center of excellence. Um, so what you need is you need to have people uh, that have the technical skills, to, to work on the data pipeline, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you also need to have people that have domain knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you typically, uh, uh, it is best to have a center of expertise in a larger organization uh, because that also helps you to scale. And so one, one of the things that I think is super important if you do process mining is uh, you do not do, don't want to do process mining for a single department or a single process. That is the dumbest thing that you can do. Uh, I, I, I sometimes compare it to make it uh, to to making the weather forecast, right? So if I want to invest in making a weather forecast, I'm not going to make the weather forecast for a single day in a single city. If I want to make weather forecast and it it has to pay off. I need to do it for all the cities every day. And the same applies to process mining. So you, you, you need to have this center of, ex of expertise. They do not need to be huge, but they need to have the capabilities in such a way that you can, that you will not apply it in one process. You will apply it in 50 processes continuously, right? Every day. And I think this is very important. And then, like, like we get back to the personas or the, that Kong mentioned uh, before. Suppose that you have, I don't know, a center of, of expertise of, let's say, five to 10 people. They can have an incredible impact on the whole organization because after they have done their work, there are thousands of people that may be consuming these process mining results every day, right? And sometimes even these improvements are done automatically without people really knowing that behind uh, the scenes process mining is, let's say, removing certain inefficiencies that are known. And another thing I think I forgot to mention is, is that because process mining software typically interact with the ERP system and, and the various things, it is also important to get the buy-in from the CIOs in an IT department. And sometimes the center of excellence Will was talking about is part of the IT department CIO, and then things can become smooth. And if they are not, then we also do need to align with the IT department very much so as well. Ah, that's interesting that um, this would live within an IT department, maybe rather than under the chief data officer. 
I think that depends on the enterprise. Um, center of Excellence for some companies live under chief data officer or even like um, directly under the CEO's purview. Uh, some others are sitting under uh, within a CIO. I actually don't know the percentage. I will probably have a better idea. Uh, to the, like also feel that like organization has been relabeling things a lot in recent years. So I think it's very difficult uh, to, to put a number. In, in general, process mining is, of course, on the interface of IT data and business, right? And that makes it very difficult to, to pinpoint at one specific location. It's also why top-level management support is super important to get this going. And also, I want to say, like uh, Will said, like, and um, you can start with one process, one department. And, and the idea is like you try it out on a few small process or a few standard process and see the benefit of it, then you can grow. It's not like, oh, every time you commit, you have to commit 50 process. I think you can you can always start small to see the benefit. Yeah, so I, I was actually wanting to pick up on that point. So um, I can see how there's definitely a benefit to dealing with lots of processes at once, because if you change one process and you optimize that, then maybe it's gonna just cause a bottleneck somewhere else. Um, but do you, how do you go about scaling then? Like um, if, have you got to go to from one to fifty processes pretty quickly then, or can you just start with one and see how that works and and gradually build it up? So I think it's very important to first understand the technology, right? And, and for for that you need it's best to start with a fairly straightforward process and then doing it. But at the same time, I think it's very important to have the ambition level to grow that, right? Because the benefits come really with scale, right? And uh, and I. Uh, the, the, the speed at which you would like to do that, I think very much uh, depends on the organization. Of course, most organizations also first want to, to see evidence that it really works before they, let's say, invest more money. Uh, I think that's also perfectly normal. Yeah, I think Richie was asking about how do you go from one process to another. I think uh, in the um, this is actually a very nice uh, segue into um, object-centric uh, process mining well, and because I think uh, before the introduction of object-centric process mining, it is indeed somewhat challenging going from one process to another because all the processes are independently processed. With object-centric, like you don't deal with the process, you deal with business objects, like an invoice. An invoice can go through many, many processes, order to cash, accounts payable, accounts receivable, and these objects actually connect all these different processes together. Now, with object-centric process mining, like, you, you do a lot of object modeling upfront. Once you do that first one or two, then extending to the rest of the process is actually much easier compared to before. So uh, I think Will has been talking about object-centric process mining for a long, long time, so I'll let, let him <laughs> elaborate on, on the benefit of that, yeah. yeah so so, so to, to clarify it for, for the people that are listening, uh, the traditional setting of process mining is that you focus on a particular process, right? So you now want to improve this process and a process is typically defined by something that you're handling, which we call a case, right? So you can track one production order, you can track one shipment, you can track one COVID patient, uh, whatever setting you have. So, so that's a classical setting. So all the events that you collect, you collect them, uh, focusing on the single case notion. That leads to the situation that if you're doing process mining in the classical sense, for example, like, like in the PMW setting, where you have 50 processes, then you start extracting 50 times data from your source systems. And each time you extract it, you extract it from the viewpoint of one particular process that you would like to, to improve and understand and, and, and see, see the problems there. If you do object-centric process mining, you take a more holistic approach. You don't extract the data having in mind, now I want to analyze this particular process. I want to track this particular case, but you extract the data uh, uh, looking at basically all the events and all the objects that are in scope. Right? Like, like uh, 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 we are now in this meeting, right? Uh, 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 so there are four, 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 person, four persons involved. 
uh, we could think of many more objects involved in this. In the classical setting, we would either follow the process of Kong, the process of Will, the process of Ritchie. But now we, we look at uh, all of this in a holistic way, capturing the events and the objects as they are really there. And one, after we have extracted the data, we start picking, okay, we would now like to analyze this process from this particular viewpoint. And this is a, a let's say, a super powerful mind shift that is now, let's say, ongoing. I've been doing research in the area for a very long time. And Salonis is the first let's say, commercial vendor really embracing this type of notion, which I think will uh, fundamentally change uh, the way that we talk about processes and do process mining. So uh, this sounds like um, it's really going to help you understand the interactions between processes rather than just looking at yeah. individual processes. So, so, so think of a customer that places an order uh, which needs to be assembled to order. Uh, so the customer places an order and now things need to be assembled. And of the things that are being assembled, uh, some of the things may be in stock, other things are not in stock. And then you need to procure them. So one problem in procurement can in the end influence, uh, let's say something at the other side of the organization. The, the same as that if you have procurement problems, that may lead to higher shipment costs, right? Because you, you start shipping things in smaller batches, et cetera, et cetera. So there are all of these interdependencies that you can only see if you have this more holistic view that I was just describing. I'd like to talk a bit about the, uh, the sort of rewards from doing process mining. So um, do you have any sense of like how you go about measuring the benefits from uh, examining your processes and updating your processes? So if you look at our website, then you will see many, many examples. I'm, I'm always a bit hesitant uh, in the sense that it's much better that our customers themselves say how much that they uh, save. But we have many examples where customers are really uh, saving millions of uh, euros or dollars uh, each year by simply applying process mining. Uh, uh, and as I said, the, these large numbers also often come with a large scale, right? Uh, the, these are larger organizations. And if I mentioned before, if 20% of your cases have certain problems and you can remove them, that is incredibly powerful. Uh, perhaps Kong, Kong would like to add? Yeah, I think uh, uh, there are always uh, two kinds of savings that you can uh, think of. The one kind is like very quantifiable. And meaning like, you know how much money you're saving, like duplicate invoice detection, right? So, and and for the duplicate invoice detected and you put a payment block or you uh, get the money back, these values combined together is very clearly, you know, like uh, how much return on investment you're already getting just by doing that. And there are also other improvements that are more like KPI level, not necessarily in dollar amount, for example, uh, using Process mining, you can improve your customer satisfaction. If you look at um, your custom, customer support flow, you may be able to improve your working capital, um, increase that by 20% or something like that, right? These are, don't necessarily translate to immediate bottom line savings directly, but in most of the enterprise, there's a conversion rate where where the, the CFOs and CEOs use, okay, if I save 20%, like in, improve 20% on working capital, and how much does that actually translate to my bottom line saving? And if I have like this customer satisfaction improved by 10%, how much does that will translate to top line growth in the future, right? So, and we, as, as well as saying, like we typically let the customer um, tell us and, and decide and, and instead of tooting our own home and, and for, the, for the second kind. But for the first kind, we know exactly how much money we are uh, saving the customers. So if, if I may add two things to, to that, because I think, think it's an important point. I think the first point is that uh, the benefits are clearly quantifiable. At the same time, we uh, enjoy working with organizations where people feel a responsibility that the processes are running correctly, right? So if you think about uh, it, it's astonishing how many organizations are paying invoices twice right? It's really astonishing. So if you are a customer and you go to a restaurant, 
but you will never pay twice, right? And if somebody would say, yeah, you're you're paying twice, you would not ask, what is the business case? No, you don't want to pay twice. If you go to the organizational setting, I think uh, if you have your processes under control, you don't need to have a business case to avoid that you're paying things multiple times, right? Uh, I I, I think it's very obvious. I I can also mention one other example that everybody can imagine how it works which shows a benefit which is uh, 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 which is the result of having better operations that immediately impacts also customers. And so, for example, Lufthansa is using uh, process mining for their standard processes, but they also use it uh, to to let's say minimize delays. So, if 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 you look at Frank- Frankfurt Airport, Munich Airport. Uh, like large hubs of Lufthansa, their process mining is being used to analyze in real time uh, uh, what are the causes of delay. And then you would be astonished that uh, uh, like the moment that the plane lands and takes off again, let's say uh, approximately 80 unique events are being recorded. And you should think about things like uh, fueling starts, fueling completed. Baggage unloading started, baggage unloading completed, gate open, et cetera, et cetera. And so you see all of the, these things. And uh, I find it fascinating because if you think about uh, this, in one hour, many things need to happen concurrently. And if one of these things fails, if the cleaning crew is not there, the whole flight gets delayed. And in the European flight, and so it may be that, that the plane is making, uh, let's say, uh, Eight, eight legs on one day. If in the morning you have a problem, you have a problem everywhere. And I think it's a nice example that you cannot immediately put into money, right? But where it is clear that because of process mining, you can uh, re- really re- reduce the number of delays that planes have by really analyzing what the root causes are in real time. And I think it's a it's a very nice example next to financial things where people, if they stand in an airport, uh, uh, that they realize that processes need to work, right? You you typically only uh, realize that there is a process if it doesn't work, right? That, 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 that then you're aware of it. If it runs well, you're not. Yeah. yeah. Here, here's one a concrete example where uh, with, with Johnson & Johnson, we looked at their using process money to look at their order delays. And uh, at the end of the um, uh, project, uh, we actually realized 20% improvement in manufacturing lead time, 30% reduction in throughput time, and 40% reduction in price changes. So these are very concrete cases um, that enterprise customers have been benefit from, uh, benefiting from process mining. Okay. I mean, those are both great examples. I think certainly a lot of people um, are going to be wishing that airlines did a bit more process mining to make sure their their uh, vacation flights uh, are on time. And certainly that does seem like um, a really, like uh, a big enough um, improvement in the process is like it is saving enough money for Johnson & Johnson, but you know, they get, that's a, a real competitive advantage there. Um, all right. Just in terms of the time scales for a payoff, I know like often when you have like a, a new idea, um, you know, management often are a bit antsy about like making sure there's a, a quick payoff. Um, what sort of a time scale are we looking at from adopting process mining to seeing those uh, improvements? Yeah, so, so if you uh, I like uh, to get started with process mining, your first project typically will take a bit more time to, to get started, right? Uh, but after that, to roll out to the next process are things that are going much faster. And so to, 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 to roll out process mining, you should think in terms of weeks to get it running. Uh, then people need to get used uh, to it. But basically, uh, the, uh, the, the results are there immediately, right? Uh, we, we, we rarely encounter processes uh, where everything is perfect, right? If everything is perfect, you don't have to do process mining. Uh, so you, 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 you typically uh, start seeing improvements uh, pretty quickly, but you need to realize that process mining is a continuous effort, right? Uh, uh, you're saving time. And so even if process mining is running year after year, you're saving uh, uh, 
let's say money year after year. Because if you would stop doing process mining, probably let's say the unhealthy habits in the process would slip back into it again, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I think to say it's not like uh, you now make one big saving. It's something that is continuous, and the longer you use it, the more you save. Yeah, we, we have clients working with us for five plus, six plus years. And, and I don't know what's the longest. The will probably have some idea, but I, I think it's very common. The clients, um, once they get a taste of how process mining is helping them monitor the process and improve the efficiency of their operation, and they, they really want to apply it to more and keep using it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so maybe a few weeks to months to get started and then something you're going to work on over a period of several years. Um, so it does seem like that the main point of this is just to um, keep improving processes over and over again. So how do you build up that feedback loop to make sure that processes do keep improving once you, like, you don't just do the analysis and then <laughs> it goes nowhere? Yeah, so, so uh, like the, the two challenges, and we spoke about one challenge, I think, a lot, uh, that is, let's say, getting the data into shape to do process mining, right? Uh, assume that that one has done that. Then the other challenge, uh, like the process mining technology does what it should do, right? It, it always works. It's a proven technology. But then, of course, the last part is how are you going to implement the changes the moment that you see these inefficiencies? Right, that, 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 that's something that's very important. And there, uh, some of these improvements, uh, uh, they are basically manual, right? You, you see that there are lots of inefficiencies in a certain area. You give the feedback and people get all the work instructions and then uh, hopefully it works by itself, but you continuously need to monitor it. Uh, so the feedback loop there is, let's say, I don't know, every week or every month, look at the actual data. And if you see that people start uh, again uh, working in the old way, you need to correct that. Uh, with the more, let's say, mature customers that we have, this feedback loop is more or less automatic in the following sense, that uh, for the known inefficiencies and the known uh, problems that we have frequently see. We set up workflows where from the process mining, you're automatically triggering workflows, uh, uh, interacting with the source systems to automatically overcome these inefficiencies. And that's why I said earlier, you can think of process mining as a layer on top of existing systems. So for example, uh, we have a, a, like a component in, in Salonis uh, that's called Action. Action Flows, it's, it's a, a company that we bought. Integromat is now called Make. Uh, and with these workflows, we can interact with over 1,000 other information systems. Uh, so of these 1,000 plus, SAP and Salesforce are, for example, two examples of what, what we can interact with. And of course, this is super powerful that the moment that you see certain known inefficiencies, that you immediately respond in the in the in the source system to make sure that that doesn't happen uh, again, and then it becomes something automatic. Of course, what you see is that if you think about process improvement, you always start with the low hanging fruit, right? Uh, that is relatively easy. After you have that under control, you start looking at the more advanced things. As uh, similar, in the beginning, uh, probably let's say. Predictive analytics are not so important, right? If you have lots of inefficiencies and obvious problems, you should first address those. But as you get more mature, you also go to more advanced types of analytics. Okay. And it seems like um, there's an aspect to change management here, in the, especially when you've got lots of different teams uh, working on a particular process. Um, do you have any advice for how you can... Um, handle the people side of things and, and managing um, across different teams and roles? Yes, yeah, so, so here it is super important, as I think we've mentioned before, is that there is top level support for doing process mining, right? Because if you find problems, uh, you need to be able to address uh, them and there may be all kinds of, let's say, internal politics uh, involved. So change management is uh, super important. 
and also buy-in from higher level management is also something important. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the power of process mining is that it is not a PowerPoint, right? People, if they look at the PowerPoint, they can question it. If you look at process mining and you see a certain inefficiency or you see certain compliance problems, people cannot deny it, right? Because if you see, for example, that the check is often bypassed, you can simply click on that line and you can see exactly the cases that had this undesirable behavior, et cetera, et cetera. And I think uh, in change management, it is super important to be able to present uh, results that are undeniable, right? If, if people can always, if people could question uh, the accuracy of the statements that one is making, right? Nothing will change. But if you can always drill down and show, okay, this is not some PowerPoint diagnostics, you can really look at the cases that had this behavior and what they were costing. I think that really helps change management. But in the end, it's it's important that people are willing to change in that setting. I, I think uh, in, in the longer time scale, I, I, we, we believe, uh, even it's happening now already in Europe, but we believe process mining is becoming an indispensable tool, just like a quarterly business review and revenue prediction that you need to do um, periodically. And uh, uh, the COO and CFO and, and even CEOs will have to periodically look at those process mining observability results and understand how efficient the company's operations are and figure out ways to make them more efficient. And I think uh, um, Salonis has been working with a lot of our Euro European customers and we are, they're already getting there. In the US, it's just picking up. Excellent. Um, all right. So uh, before we wrap up, uh, can you tell me um, what are you most excited about in the world of process mining at the moment? Um, yeah, Adam, Kong, do you want to go first and then? Sure. Yeah, I, I have a lot of things I'm very excited about. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be joining this company a year ago. But one of the things that I think is super, super interesting to me and, and internally we're just discussing and the, uh, with generative AI, large language model, there's going to be a lot of transformation happening um, in the process of the companies, right? Think about all these um, AP clerks and, and encoding gel code in your invoices and all these are going to be disrupted by, um, by uh, large language and modern machine learning. And, uh, and um, during this transformation process, it's very important for you to, for enterprise to monitor how effective these transformations are. Are they actually improving um, the desired KPIs you care about? Right from that perspective, and process mining is your observability too, and 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 you keep monitoring your process. You understand through this AI transformation how efficient, how effective your process has become. And I think this this is like there's no other tool better than like none of the the other tools you're thinking about, like a data mining or BI, is, is nearly at, at the process mining maturity in terms of observing your processes. So. Especially in this time, I think a lot of the um, CEOs are thinking about like, how is AI going to impact my business and my operations? And it's the right time to pick up process mining <laughs> and really use that to monitor. And I think this is probably one of the most exciting things I'm thinking about. But of course, there are others as well. But well, yeah. yeah for, for, for me, like the whole area of process mining is super excited, right? I, I, I started working on this uh, in the late 90s as a research project, right? And, and now it's a complete industry. So I think uh, there are many developments that have happened that I find uh, super uh, exciting. But on the, on the technical uh, side, when I talked about, uh, let's say, the two innovations that I find most exciting at this point in time, one was already mentioned, that was the, uh, let's say, object-centric process mining. Yeah, so uh, uh, that requires us to basically reinvent existing process mining techniques and bring them to another level. And that is something that is super exciting. And, and uh, we are working on that both on the research side and, and on the company side. We are working on that with, with many uh, people. Uh, all the people in the field uh, see this as one of the uh, uh, breakthroughs, let's say, of the last 10 years, what is happening now. So, so that's super exciting. Another thing that, that I find, uh, uh, find uh, super exciting is that 
I think many organizations are struggling with applying machine learning in a business setting. And I think uh, uh, process mining is the technology to help lower the threshold for organizations to start using machine learning in a meaningful way. I expect that many organizations will get disappointed and that they have unrealistic ideas of everything that they can do. And I think uh, process mining will prove to be something that is very down to earth, that will help you to generate the machine learning problems where, uh, let's say, you get really reliable results. Uh, so I think these are, for me, uh, the two things that uh, I will be enjoying working on the next couple of years. Excellent. It does really feel like process mining is sort of just about ready to hit the mainstream uh, and get uh, much wider adoption. All right, brilliant. Uh, with that, I think uh, thank you both for your time. It's been great having you both on the show. Yeah. Thanks, Richie. Enjoy the conversation very much. Thanks, Richie. It was great. Mm-hmm.